Well, it's a blessing to be with you today. Rhonda and I count it a privilege to uh, come and, and share with you. Never been to Stafford before, Fellowship Baptist, but I know many of you. <laughs> know Neville and Alice and Azrael. I believe, uh, Neville, that yours was the first wedding that I officiated at, wasn't it? That's in Gladstone? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I was pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Gladstone for about seven years. And uh, so, yeah, Neville and Alice were first wedding that we officiated at. So that was a blessing. All right, Luke chapter 22 this morning. Do you know that you've been born again? That's a good question to ask, isn't it? And uh, I trust that each one of us would ask ourselves that question. Have I been born again? We're going to look today, uh, Luke 22, um, at Peter's sifting. Good to be uh, reacquainted with Brother Carver and, and Mrs. Carver again. Many years that uh, went and visited them at Malulaba when they were preaching there. And uh, good to see Rivo too. Well, he's not here. Oh, yes, he is. There he is. Sorry. Rivo and Jimmy. And uh, so I do know many. Of, we know many of you. <coughs> Actually haven't been here before, but that's uh, today's changed that, hasn't it? Luke 22 Verses 31 and 32, we'll just read them and then we'll, we'll pray. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let's just pray, shall we, and ask the Lord's help and his blessing this morning. Heavenly Father, we just rejoice at uh, the gathering of your people here at Fellowship Baptist at Stafford. We just pray that you would meet with us today, speak to us through your word, help us to understand it, give clarity to my thoughts, and Lord, may your Holy Spirit have free course in our midst today. We think of Brother Bramblett and his dear wife and commit them to you as they'll be travelling back soon and uh, pray for your protecting hand upon them and we thank you for them. So Lord, we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, Peter's sifting. This is an interesting passage, sort of uh, these two verses just in the midst of this chapter, chapter 22 of Luke. It's a power-packed chapter. So much happens here. The highs and lows of this chapter are, are immense, you know. Starts off with uh, just the fact that the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, the Passover, in verse 1. And uh, then it mentions about the fact that Satan enters into Judas Iscariot. And Judas, we know, was about to betray the Lord Jesus. Uh, then in verse 8, we see Peter and John being sent and said, go, you know, Jesus said, go and prepare us the Passover. They said, well, where do we go? Jesus told them and, and it happened exactly as Jesus said would happen. They would find a, a, uh, a large upper room ready and they would prepare the Passover there. So we see the Lord's provision there. We see the Lord's Supper being instituted in verse Verses 16 onwards, and uh, uh, he breaks bread and, and drinks wine with the disciples. And uh, so great things happen here. You know, great highs, but then great lows, because then we see the betrayal, the actual betrayal mentioned in verse 22, uh, that he, he knows that he's going to be betrayed, and he's actually... Uh, hands food to the very one, Judas, while he's in their midst. And then they have a strife, it says, between them. You know, they began to inquire, well, who's that? And, and then it says there was a strife as to, you know, who's the greatest amongst us? Fancy that, you know. The disciples were just like us, weren't they? You know, we, we have strife, don't we, in our, in our families. We have strife in churches because we just, we're people you know, just like the disciples. And we have struggles and strains between us. And one of us thinks we're, we're more, uh, you know, we ought to sort of be more prominent than others. And, and uh, the Lord says, no, 
No. And he speaks to them then about the fact of who is the greatest is the one that is prepared to serve, not be served. Jesus, of course, demonstrated that, didn't he? He was prepared to serve. He didn't come to sit on a pedestal and on a th high throne. He came to serve and then he came to die for us. So there's just great highs and lows in this passage. And, uh, uh, you know, as Jesus is speaking to the disciples, you know, and you get to verse 29 and, and he commends them, sorry, in verse 28, that you've continued with me in my temptations or in my trials to this point. You fellows have stuck with me. He commends them there. But then he says, uh, uh, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, whenever we hear a message, we, we will pick things out of a message, won't we? Well, I sort of figure, and this is my figuring, okay, and you can take it or leave it, but I kind of figure that before the crucifixion and here in this time, you know, the Passover time, that feast, the, 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 the Lord's Supper, and then Jesus is speaking to them, I kind of figure that the disciples didn't hear a lot of what he was saying. They heard bits and I reckon verse 29 was a, was a verse that they heard and they clutched onto. Yes, it's coming. The kingdom is coming. We are going to be appointed thrones, it says there, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I reckon they heard that bit. And they grasped the hold of that. Wow, it's not going to be long before Jesus overcomes the Romans and... We're going to be sitting on 12 thrones with him. It's not far away, boys. And they began to talk about it between them. And, but I reckon I'll be closest to Jesus, you know. John perhaps said, and James, remember James and John had already approached him before this time and with their mother and said, you know, we have a request. And uh, you can't deny us that request. We want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand. Well, he gently told them that I can't give you that, can I? That's of my father to give. But they'd already been thinking about it a lot, hadn't they? So I reckon they sort of clasped hold of that verse 30 and 29 and 30. You know, I appoint unto you a kingdom and uh, you're going to sit with me you know, on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then sort of there's an interjection, verse 31 and 32, and we really don't want to hear this. You know, I like that bit, but did they really hear the next bit? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. You know, often Peter's the spokesman, isn't he? And often Jesus uh, uh, speaks to Peter. In, the, in verse 31, he's actually speaking to the whole lot of them, the whole 12 disciples. Judas is still there. He hasn't gone out at that point, has he? Or had he gone out at that point? Anyway, the 12 disciples are there and Jesus is speaking to them all. You have a look in verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. And I love our King James Bible because it gives us a picture. You know, when it talks about you or ye or your, we always know it's plural. So he was speaking to you as in you all. But then you have a look in verse 31, but I have prayed for thee, changes to singular. You know, and you only get that in our King James Bible. You don't get that in other modern translations. It's always just you or your, and you can't figure out whether it's singular or plural. But our King James Bible is such a blessing to us. Verse 31, he's speaking to you. He addresses Peter, but he's actually speaking to the whole of the 12 disciples. 
Satan hath desired to have you, 12, that he may sift you, 12, as wheat. But then he singular, singularly points out Peter and he says, but I have prayed for thee, Neville, Peter, you know, but I have prayed for thee, thee, Peter, that thy faith, see there's thee, there's thy, and there's also thou in that verse. A lot of us sort of, we, we grumble about the these, thous, and the thys, but I tell you what, we want to be thankful for them in our King James Bible. We really do. Because it tells us who he's speaking to here, specifically. First of all, the whole group of the disciples, because he says you. So whenever you have ye, you, or your, it's plural in our Bible. But when it specific, when it comes to thee, thou, or thy, it's singular. Or thine. Thine is not used here in this verse, but the other three are. Thee, thy, and thou are in this verse, verse 32. But I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy, Peter, thy faith fail not. And when thou, Peter, art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So I want to spend just a few minutes this morning about sort of thinking about, well, what does this mean? That you're going to be sifted as wheat. Satan has desired to have you all, but he's going to sift you as wheat. And then Peter, you've got to grasp this individually. And I've prayed for you, Peter, individually. I'm glad the Lord prays for us. I'm glad he prays for us individually, not just the crowd. You know, isn't that good? The Lord loves us individually. He doesn't just love us as a big bunch, although he does love us as a bunch, as a church, as a church here in Stafford, he loves us. But he knows us individually, James. He knows us individually, Brother Carver. And he prays for us individually. Oh, I'm glad of that. You know, the Lord Jesus is our advocate. And he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven now and he prays for us. But oh, when he was walking here on earth, he prayed in the flesh for these men. And he specifically says here, Peter, I've prayed for thee. I've prayed for thee. Oh, what a blessing. Did Peter hear it then? Well, I'm not sure that he heard too much of it. Because he boldly said in verse 33, Lord, I... Oh, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. I, you, you know, I don't know whether he thought, well, you don't need to pray for me, but you know, he was so determined. He was so set in his way, like, oh, it's okay, Jesus. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fail you. I'm going to be with you to the end. Now, I, you know, I scratch my head and I think, well, Peter heard that bit about the kingdom, yes. He was really looking forward to judging the 12 tribes or being those one, the one and, and uh, he knew, he knew that the kingdom was going to come. Like it was imminent, just now it was going to happen. And, uh, but I don't quite understand how he got to the thinking in verse 33, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. How was the kingdom going to be instituted if he was going to be in prison and dead? I don't know what he was thinking, whether he was thinking, well, even if that happens, Jesus is just going to resurrect us all in a blink and, and the kingdom's still going to come in. I don't know. But anyway, he was muddled, wasn't he? I reckon he was muddled and addled in his mind a little bit. Jesus said, look, I tell you, Peter, verse 34 the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice or three times deny that thou knowest me. He was really speaking individually still to Peter, wasn't he, there? And then he speaks about to them about, uh, you know, did you lack anything in verse 35? Did you ever lack anything when I sent you out? 
when I sent you out without purse and script, without your wallet and without your bag, script means bag, and without your shoes, your sandals, did you ever lack anything? Sort of gets them to remember, you know, the last three years when Jesus was walking with them and they said, no, you always provided for us everything. And then he says to them, well, now, if you have a purse, take it, and your bag, get it. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And uh, for I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, which is Isaiah 53, isn't it? For the things concerning me have an end. So Jesus, you know, quoted that little bit of scripture there. uh, And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said, that's enough. You got enough. So Peter was one of those that had a sword. We know that from John, John chapter 18 and verse 10. We, it specifically says it was Peter that smote off of off Malchus's ear. The other three uh, gospels don't. It just says someone, one of them, smote off the servant's ear. But in John it specifically says it was Peter. So Peter had one of the swords. You know, and uh, I, I don't know how they thought that two was going to be enough, but on the other hand, they knew that Jesus was going to multiply swords when the time came, you know. Well, he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, didn't he? We only had a few loaves and a few fishes. He's provided for us for three years. Everything he ever said, it was there. Remember back at the beginning of this chapter? He sent them to, to get the ready the room. It was already ready. They found it just as he said. You know, Jesus was, Jesus provides for us, doesn't he? He provided for them so well for three years. They saw miracle after miracle. So two swords, well, that's enough. Jesus will just, there'll be plenty of swords when it's necessary. He'll multiply swords like he did the loaves and the fishes. So we got two swords, that's enough. Boy, it's definitely coming, boys. It's really coming. He's going to institute the kingdom. We're going to be there with the fight. If there's a fight, we're ready. He's going to multiply swords. But it didn't happen that way, did it? All right, let's just go back to the verse 31 and 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Peter didn't hear this bit. Oh, he heard it, but it just went out the other window, you know. Went in one ear and it went out the other. No, I'm going to be with you to prison and to death if necessary. No, I I know you're going to multiply swords. It's fine. I won't deny you. But the the verse says, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Why did Satan desire the disciples to sift them as wheat? I want you to come back with me to uh, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. As we turn to Luke chapter 3, you know, Satan knows scripture. In fact, he probably knows it far better than you and I do. And Satan hears the words of people. And uh, in John chapter 3, no, Luke chapter 3, sorry, verse 17, John the Baptist is speaking here. And uh, back in uh, verse 15, the people were in expectation, but the men, all men mused or they wondered in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. And John answered, so they asked John, are you the Christ? He answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptise you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now I wonder whether Satan 
heard those words, or his henchmen did and and replied it to Satan. Satan knew that. You know, he knows scripture. He heard these words, or he heard of them being said. And it's possible that he approached God like he approached Job. Remember in Job chapter 1, it speaks of, we don't have many, we only have, as far as I know, these two references about Satan asking to have somebody. We have it in Job, don't we? Actually, let's go there to Job. Let's go to Job, Job chapter 1. Just sort of remind ourselves or uh, remember what, happens here in Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, and there was a day in verse 6 when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and esteweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job, sorry, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. So Satan desired Job after the Lord pointed him out to him, Satan said, he serves you because you've given him everything. He serves you because you wrap a hedge around him. But if you take it away, he'll curse you to your face. So, the only other time that we know there's a dialogue between Satan and God is here with Peter in Luke chapter 3. Or Luke chapter 22, sorry. And I wonder if it went a little bit like this. Perhaps Satan was again before, you know, came to present himself before God. And God said to to him, have you considered my uh, 12 disciples that are walking with my son? How they've walked with him faithfully for three years. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, of course they walk with him for three years because you give him everything. Whatever you've said to them has come to pass. You told Peter that there'd be tax money for him in the fish's mouth. Well, he went and he got the fish and sure enough it was there. You provided for them in the upper room. You provided for them fish the night that they fished all night and got nothing. Of course he'd walk. Of course they'd walk with him because he gave them everything all the time. He protects them all the time. But listen, I know that it's time they were sifted. Remember what John the Baptist said about him? He said his fan is in his hand. Well, I haven't seen his fan in his hand yet. He's been walking on the earth for three years and he hasn't sifted anyone. I heard John the Baptist say that he'd have his fan in his hand. And the Lord said, well, okay, if you want them to sift them as wheat, you go ahead and try. He said, yeah, give me the job. I can do it. He was supposed to do it. He hasn't done it yet. 
Now that's my thinking, okay? That's not Bible, all right? This was all my thinking. It's just my mind going off. But I just wonder how it was. We need to have a bit of a sort of a think about the fan, don't we? You know, you and I sort of, we don't live on a wheat farm, do we, here in the city? But he's talking about wheat when it's harvested at harvest time and and in Israel when they harvested the wheat in those days they would take a sickle or a scythe and they would cut the wheat down by hand and then gather it into sheaves, what's called sheaves, and, uh, and bind the sheaves, bind the grain into sheaves so it would be the cut wheat, you know, with the stalks on it like that and the, the, the heads of wheat at the top, they would bind it into sheaves about that big, wrap it up with string or something like that and then they'd stand it up in the paddock in what's called stooks, stooks of sheaves. And then they'd gather up the stooks when it was all dry on a hot day and they would take it to the winnowing floor. And the winnowing floor would be perhaps something like this platform, maybe bigger, but they'd have all the sheaves all, all stacked up on the, on, the, on the winnowing floor. And the first step of the winnowing would be to take the sheaves lay them on the floor and they would take what's called a flail and it would be like a, a, a stick with a leather strap on the end of it and they would hit the wheat on the end of the, of the, the, uh, the stalk, you know, you've got the stalk with the wheat on the end, the heads, and they would undo the, sh- the, 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 the sheaves and lay them on the, on the floor and they would literally belt the wheat until it separated off of the stalks. Okay, they'd gather up the stalks and throw that off the end of the, of the platform and so then you'd have a, a, a mountain of, of wheat and husks, what they call chaff and dust and dirt and stuff, all right? Because the, the, the stalks would sort of break up and the, and the husk around the, around the kernel of wheat would sort of break off but it would all be mixed together. So then, usually in night or in the late afternoons, when there would be a steady breeze, probably about a 20k breeze, 15, 20k breeze, be blowing across the, the winnowing floor, they would take then what was called a fan, and that's what it's talking about there, whose fan is in his hand. And the fan is a picture of judgment or separation, where they take the fan and they'd fill it up with wheat sort of as much as a man could pick up and carry, perhaps about 20 kilos of, of wheat, but it would be wheat mixed with chaff and dust. And this fan would be sort of like a, a scoop like that, with you know, it'd sort of have, be about that de- deep and, and uh, sort of be a sieve underneath, a sieve that would let the dust through but not the wheat. The wheat would still stay in the sieve. And they'd take that fan and pick up, say, 20 kilos, about what a man could pick up, 20 to 40 kilos, perhaps, of wheat and chaff. And as the wind is blowing through, they'd sort of chuck it up in the air a bit and, so, and sort of shake it, you know, shake it. The dust would fall out through and chuck it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff through, okay? So the, the dust would go out that way the, 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 the chaff would blow out that way and then would be just left in the fan would be the wheat that was left. All the pinched grain, small grain, would go de- out through, the, through the, uh, the bottom and the chaff would blow away like that and they'd be left with wheat. And uh, the picture here in, in Luke chapter 3 is it says whose fan is in his hand and he will truly purge his floor. That means he would thoroughly separate the wheat from the chaff. And there'd be no mistake. Because often you'd do it and you'd still get bits of chaff or bits of dust and stuff still with the wheat. But the picture is that when Jesus separates the wheat and the chaff, there's nothing mixed up. It's done properly. Like it's really separated properly. And the whole floor, all that mountain of wheat would be sorted out really well. So Satan says to to God, 
You let me add them, I'll sift them as wheat. And I reckon he probably threw in the words, I reckon they're just chaff. And he would have said it with a snarl. They're just chaff. You let me add them. You let me shake them. You let me chuck them up in the air and the wind blow and they're just chaff. There'll be nothing left. No wheat left. They're all rubbish. Okay, the Lord says, okay, you can have a go. You can have a go. So Satan got his go. Got his go. That's the picture though, isn't it? Psalm chapter 1 says that the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. There's a real picture there of separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Satan thought he'd have his go at, uh, at separating wheat from chaff. I don't know what he thought he was going to do with the wheat when he got it in his fan, but that's another story. Okay. You know, it says in, uh, because we know that, because we can see the whole story, can't we? We know, sort of looking back, that it was all part of the crucifixion. The disciples had to be sort of trialed. They had to be tested to see whether there was faith there. And it was part of the fact of Jesus going to the cross. He, Jesus couldn't tell them everything. Although he did, he told them very plainly that he was going to the cross, but they really didn't hear it. They really didn't hear it because it was so kept hidden from them. And it was hidden from Satan too. Otherwise, the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8 that if they had have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you all that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You know, it behooves all of us to uh, take stock and to think about the fact that, you know, there may be times where, or a time, where Satan desires to sift you and me. You know, Job did not know when permission was given by God for him to be sifted, did he? Peter was warned about it. Peter was sort of told prior to it happening. But for Job, it wasn't. And for you and I, if, uh, if Satan should desire us individually to sift us as wheat, we probably won't know about it, just like Peter didn't, or Job didn't, sorry. And you know, that sifting, the sieve that is taken to throw that wheat up into the air, in our cases, the sieve is often, is made out of something, well, not exactly just like a sieve, you know. In Job's case, it was loss, wasn't it? It was the loss of all his belongings. Job's sheep, his cattle, his camels, his asses, everything was taken away from him, all of his belongings. His children, he lost seven children in one day. That would be a sifting for us, wouldn't it, if we lost our children in one day? Any of us, you know. If you lost your house at any time, how would your faith handle it? How, how would you go? You go out of here today and your car's wiped out. And perhaps, you know, even worse than that. How would you handle it? What would you do? Would you blame God for it? 
Or would you say like Job, I came into this world naked and I'll go out naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says he charged God not foolishly. In uh, Peter's case, what was the sieve made out of? You know, he'd had it good, hadn't he, for three years. He'd walked with Jesus. He'd walked with God. God in the flesh. He'd had every provision given to him along the way. He'd had his mother-in-law healed one day. You know, he had, remember the fish that they gathered when they'd fished all night and got nothing, but Jesus said, well, just cast your net on the other side. And they got a whole scoop of fish. The, The boat started to sink everything, you know. They saw great provisions from the Lord and and it was going so good. And the kingdom's just about to come in, you know. The Romans are going to lose their perch. Oh, it couldn't be better. And suddenly things went pear-shaped. What was the sieve that Peter had? Well, I reckon it was disappointment. I reckon it was Pain, you know, pain at watching his Lord taken away, led away. But I reckon it was perhaps also humiliation. Humiliation. You know, he thought, and remember, this is, this is my thoughts, but I'm sort of trying to just dig out what's, what the text is. You know, he, he heard Jesus say, Look, you, got a, you, you haven't had a sword up to now, but now's the time. Go get a sword. Well, he, he thought, Peter thought, hey, I'm going to get to use a sword. We might need some swords. Jesus always has a reason for everything. And his provision is always there along the way. And, well, he said, get a sword. So I have a sword. And when Jesus was taken he said master shall we smite with the sword well he was ready in his flesh he was ready to defend Jesus and uh, he jumped out and he and and the scriptures tell us that he smoked Malchus's ear and cut it off now I don't reckon I don't reckon this is me again speaking I don't reckon Peter aimed for his ear (laughs) I reckon he aimed to take his head off or go straight through his heart. Well, this is me thinking, I reckon an angel was there and deflected that sword and just sort of scraped his ear. That's all he got. <laughs> I'm not that bad at swordsmanship. And, and I reckon he was just totally humiliated. You know, I'm ready to defend you, Jesus. And you <laughs> wouldn't even let me take his head off. Like I had him. Peter could, Peter could carve fish up. He could carve Mouches' head off or smite him in the heart. He wasn't that bad a fisherman. Like he could, he could fillet fish. He knew what a sharp, sharp sword could do. So, you know, I reckon, this is my thinking, but I reckon Peter was humiliated. And then when Jesus came, Got the ear. Did he have to stoop down and pick it up? Or did he just touch Mouchus and the ear just bang? It was back there and healed. And... I cut the jolly thing off. You know, how come it's back there again? Like, Jesus, miracles are good, but not now. <laughs> like, we got it. We've got to defeat the Romans. We got These fellas, they shouldn't be leading you away. Like, this is the time for battle. Not miracles. And I think Peter was humiliated. And that was the sieve that he was allowed to have, you know. Satan was allowed to humiliate him for a time. He was allowed to strike pain and rejection. He felt rejected by his saviour right then. Just earlier in the chapter, he'd 
It was great. We went and found, just as he said, we found the room. It was ready and we prepared the Passover and we had a great meal with Jesus. And, and then we, oh, we had that supper with him and it was so good. And, but now, why is all this happening? Why a miracle now? Like it can't be. This should not be. And Peter was humiliated. He had pain he'd never felt before. He had rejection he'd never felt before. And folks, I want to leave it with you. You know, there could be sifting coming in your life and mine of which we never thought about before. Could be loss like Job. Could be pain. Job felt immense pain as the days went by. And then the boils started to grow on his body. And he sat on the dunghill for seven days with his friends looking at him. And then eventually they began speaking and they didn't help one bit. They just cast more into his teeth and said, if you weren't such a sinner, Job, well... You wouldn't be in such a mess. Job felt humiliated then too, didn't he? So he felt the whole gamut. Pain, loss, rejection. Even his wife told him to curse God and die. Oh, folks. It just doesn't seem right, but sometimes the Lord allows us to go through immense shifting to see whether we're really wheat or not. You see, the wheat is gathered into his garner or his barn. That's a picture of heaven. Whereas the chaff is just blown away. That's a picture of rejection, picture of hell, burnt with unquenchable fire. We want to be wheat. We want to be found to be pure wheat. Good grain. We want to be gathered into God's garner, into heaven. But we may go through immense sifting before we get there. It could be any of those things I said. Loss, pain, rejection, humiliation. All sorts of things. Misunderstood by our friends, our family relatives, all sorts of things. But we can be confident of this. If we know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour, he has prayed for us. He's prayed for us that our faith fail not. And when we're converted, we can strengthen the brethren. That's what he said to Peter. You know, I'll just finish with this. When we are converted means to be turned again, turned again. We often need to be turned back to the Lord, don't we? We often find ourselves straying off the path, just like a sheep. I haven't talked about sheep too much today. I I'm, I'm often speak about sheep, but I'll just finish with one, one passage, pa uh, Psalm 80, Psalm 80. Just come with me there to Psalm 80 and we'll finish. Psalm 80. I've dealt with sheep a lot in my life. I've been a sheep shearer, managed a sheep station for uh, seven years out west. And when you're mustering sheep or dealing with sheep, you find that you have to turn them many, many times, you know, to keep them in a mob, keep them together and keep them going in the direction that you want them to go. And in Psalm, verse, Psalm chapter 80, verse 1, it says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. So the psalmist is speaking to the Lord. Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. In verse 3, turn us again, O God. He, just, he implores the Lord. He said, just be patient with us. Please be patient with us. Turn us again. And that's the same picture as back there in uh, Luke 22 where he says when thou art converted 
when you're turned again, Peter, when you've got your face back to me again, you're going to go astray for a little bit, but you're going to be turned back. And that's the picture here. The Lord, the psalmist says, Lord, turn us again, bring us back, convert us. Doesn't mean re-saved. You can't be re-saved. You can't be reborn again. You can only be born again once into the kingdom of God. But we stray very easily as God's sheep. And we need to be turned again. And the Lord said, Peter, when you're turned again, then strengthen your brethren. Have a look at verse 7. Verse 7 in Psalm 80, it says, Turn us again. O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Down in verse, uh, not 14, but verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And I think it's over in verse, uh, chapter 85, and verse 4 says, Turn us, O God of our salvation, turn us. So, folks, I'll just leave you with that. I hope it's not a, uh, a sour message today. I hope it's a message of strengthening. But I do say, you know, the sifting can come in our lives at any time. We don't know what can come. But if we sort of know it's possible, we know the God of our salvation we can trust him to turn us again, turn us back to him, be patient with us like he was with Peter. Wasn't he immensely patient with Peter? And he does the same with us. I'd also leave you with the thought, pray for each other constantly. You know, when we see somebody, someone in our midst just getting astray, going astray, it happens to us all at one stage or another, we look at somebody and we say, oh, they're going astray. Don't be like Job's friends and say, oh, you must have fallen into great sin. Well, it might have, but you might have just just turned, just gone astray a little bit. Just pray for each other, like Jesus prayed for Peter. Oh, Lord, help him to turn again back to you. Don't be judgmental of each other. Lord, be patient. Turn him again. Turn him again. Turn her again. Turn us again. And then might we strengthen each other, encourage each other in the faith. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We thank you for your patience with Peter. Thank you that you turned him again. Thank you that even though he denied you three times, denied that you even existed, denied that, you'd, that he'd walked with you for three years, tried to hide all that. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you forgave him. We thank you that he went on and became a great preacher and he strengthened the brethren in a great way. We thank you for that, Lord. So we just thank you that that encourages us to just continue to walk with you and be patient with one another. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.